Hi everyone, welcome to Unit 4, Chapter 2, where we will be going over natural selection. This is a continuation of our discussion on the theory of evolution from last week. Now, last week we talked about populations as a whole and how they are going to change over time. Now we're going to be talking about what is the mechanism of that change, which is natural selection. As always, if you click on this book, you will get a copy of the guided notes. If you would like to print those out and fill them out as we go along, I highly suggest it because there may be an extra opportunity, extra credit opportunity unlocked later throughout the semester. Now, last week we said that the populations are going to be pretty predictably like the parents unless these five things are happening. Random mutations. Random mutations can be harmful, but they could also be beneficial. But more often than not, these random mutations don't really do anything. And so they just accumulate over time. Next is gene flow. This is the introduction of new genes to a species, usually through migration. We also have genetic drift, which is usually some sort of natural disaster that causes a bottlenecking or a founder's effect. Uh, then we have non-random mating. We will be talking about that today. Uh, for instance, sexual selection, which means mate choice. That can have a huge impact on the phenotype of a population. So we'll be going over that. But most of what we're going to be talking about is natural selection. These are naturally occurring pressures that a population will feel due to its environment, um, the amount of food available, and the number of predators. So who came up with the theory of evolution? Well, uh, Darwin or Charles Darwin is credited with publishing the first book on the theory of evolution, but his ideas were not new. His ideas were largely based on Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's failed theory of evolution. Um, and also Jane, uh, James Hutton's theory of gradualism, where those gradual changes happen over time. But what was missing in those theories was Charles Darwin's observation about the mechanism of what is driving these changes over time. So the mechanism that Darwin proposed, he called it descent with modification, essentially meaning that these changes, these random occurrences, they don't matter unless those genes are also passed on into the gene pool or into the next generation. So for instance, Darwin's finches. Um, Darwin made this observation that on this tiny little isolated island, there's way too many finches to make sense. You've got some finches that eat plants, you've got some finches that eat seeds, you've got some finches that um, eat cactus, like really hard, dense foods. Um, and then you have some finches that eat insects. And how is this possible? So Darwin proposed that there was an ancestor finch, a common ancestor to all these different types of finches. And this ancestor found its way onto this isolated island. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been able to um, lead to all these different species of finches. So he theorized that there was one common ancestor and that that common ancestor had plenty of food, plenty of space, plenty of uh, everything, lots of mates. And so they, it experienced a population boom. And since there were so many members of this population, some of them began to die due to lack of food or too much competition. So randomly, one individual, maybe two or three, uh, happened to have this uh, trait. It's a new trait, a mutated trait, where it had a slightly sharper beak. Now, that slightly sharper beak allowed it to eat different foods or more uh, difficult foods for everyone else. And so it began to eat only that type of food and mate with other birds that only ate that type of food. So those birds were no longer in competition with the main population, and eventually this led to speciesation as they became more and more isolated. And within that population, as a sharp beak became more and more common, it was more and more common that it would be passed on to the next generation. So um, this is what Charles Darwin's observations led him to believe, that there is adaptations and those adaptations, if they're beneficial, get passed on to the next generation.
Um, this is based on his uh, logic that all species, no matter what they are, are going to reproduce so much that they outlive their environment or they outlive the resources of their environment. For instance, these little fish in this fishbowl, they have plenty of space, plenty of food. They are going to mate and reproduce indefinitely until they reach a point where there's too many fish for the environment. Now there's not enough food, there's not enough space, and there's not enough mates, meaning that automatically some of those fish are going to die. And if they die, they are not able to pass on their genes to the next generation. This means that some genes are going to be passed on to the next generation while others are not. So hopefully those genes are advantageous to the population. This is called a carrying capacity. This is the average number of a population or the average size of a population that can survive in a given habitat due to the resources available. So if there's plenty of food, plenty of water, plenty of space, the carrying capacity for that population might be higher than, say, in a tiny island without as many resources. In this instance, we're talking about fish inside of a fishbowl. It would have a very small carrying capacity. Now, that's not the only thing that is driving those changes. Another part to that puzzle is called natural selection, meaning that some animals are naturally going to be selected for, and some of them are naturally going to be selected against. For instance, these mice. We have some variation within the phenotype of the mice, very light colored mice and very dark colored mice. But if these mice lived in an environment that was also dark in coloration, predators would very easily be able to see the white mice. Therefore, those white mice would not be able to reproduce and pass on the white gene. So the next generation would have less and less of that white color. Um, if you want to click on this picture, we can do a simulation of this exact thing. If I'm a wolf and I'm trying to eat these little bunnies, let's say there's brown bunnies and there's gray bunnies, um, I can see both of them pretty easily. So I'm just going to town. I'm going to eat as many fuzzies as I possibly can um, until the timer runs out. So just start clicking. OK, so the timer ran out. So I started out with 60 percent brown and 38 percent gray. Uh, that's not exactly an even split, but look what happened. By the end of it, it was almost 50-50, so 45-55. That's because the predator could easily select either color. But what if we lived in a gray, rocky environment? Now the predator is going to have a really hard time seeing those gray bunnies because they just blend into the environment so well. So my predator is eating as many animals as it can but you might notice that we can't eat those gray bunnies as easily because they're harder to see. So I started out with basically 50-50, so 57% gray, 43% brown, but by the end of that simulation, my population was 100% gray. Now, think about this population. If this population breeds and reproduces, what is it gonna look like next year? What is it gonna look like in five years? Well, I wouldn't really expect many brown individuals since there are no brown individuals that are able to pass on that brown trait. All right. Um, this is also leads us to the idea of fitness. I know everybody has heard the term survival of the fittest, but that is missing a piece. It is not just survival of the fittest. For instance, if I had superpowers and I could fly and I could had super strength. You would say that I'm very fit, but I would not have evolutionary fitness unless I had a baby. Relative fitness is not just an advantage in survival. It's an advantage in survival and reproduction. So there needs to be some variation within the population for you to be able to see relative fitness because it has to be relative to the other members of the population. For instance, these green and brown beetles, there's variation within the population. Some are green and some are brown. If they live in a very brown environment like the tree bark here, predators can easily see these green beetles and they get eaten.
meaning that there is relative fitness advantage to being brown. And so brown gets passed on to the next generation at a higher rate than green. If you'd like to, you can click on this image and it will lead you to a simulation where you get to design your own creature with its own natural adaptations and see whether you have relative fitness or not. Remember, relative fitness, your goal is to reproduce, not just to survive. So let's look at these two birds. Which one has more relative fitness? This bird that lived 20 years or this bird that lived five years? Well, in this bird's 20 year lifespan, it only gave birth to two offspring and those two offspring gave birth to two offspring. But in this bird's short five year lifespan, it gave birth to four offspring and each of those offspring gave birth to four offspring. So the relative fitness is definitely in this guy's favor. He has a lot more relative fitness even though his life was cut short. If you would like to look at this video, go back to the PowerPoint and watch the video. I highly suggested it. it's very informative about this population of lizards and they will show you uh, two different kinds of lizards and how adapted they are to their environment. Um, very informative, but the video within a video gets a little uh, strange. Um, so what is the mechanism of evolution? Well, according to Darwin, the mechanism of evolution is going to be all of those things combined. Um, mainly natural selection, but natural selection only occurs when there's variation within the population. For variation to occur, you need random mutations or gene flow or some other way to get that uh, um, uh, advantage. So the mechanism of evolution, there's no real wrong answer. All of the things that we have been talking about are mechanisms of evolution. Now let's talk about patterns of evolution. We talked about mechanisms of evolution, but natural selection doesn't just select one trait. It has different patterns. For instance, directional selection. In directional selection, um, let's say that we have this population of mice. There's lots of variation within the population, some very dark colored and some very light colored. As we learned in the previous slides, that light coloration really sticks out to predators. So let's say all the predators ate these white uh, mice. That means that there are no white mice to pass on that gene to the next generation. So we end up with all the whole population being pushed towards the direction of one extreme. In this case, it would be the gray coloration. This is directional selection. That does not mean that selection is goal oriented. It just means that the whole population um, shifts more towards that trait that was selected for and more away from the trait that was selected against. Now, there is also something called disruptive selection. Let's say that these mice didn't live in that dark environment. They lived in a rocky, snowy environment, like a mountain. In that case, white mice would probably be able to camouflage pretty well, and gray mice would also probably be able to camouflage pretty well. So what we would see is we would see more white mice and more gray mice. But the mice that would stick out really well for predators would be these medium brown mice. So we are going to see less and less brown mice. So at first we see like a flattening of the curve where we see less in the middle and more on the ends, but eventually this will turn into a bimodal curve or a two part curve. And these curves can move further and further apart, leading to a speciesation event if sexual isolation occurs. And the last pattern that we will talk about is stabilizing selection. Let's say that the extremes were selected against, so we're gonna see less and less extremes, but this medium color is selected for, so we're gonna see more and more of that. This eventually will lead to a very homogenized population that all have that same medium trait. Um, one example, a really great example of directional selection is the peppered moths. Now, peppered moths naturally come in these two phenotypes, a very dark color and a light kind of peppery color. Now, this light peppery color is really, really well camouflaged against this tree bark. You can see here, this actually is a moth. It is not bark, but it's really well camouflaged. 
the dark coloration, however, uh, is not very well camouflaged. It's very, very visible. So how come that trait still occurs? Well, that's because this is a, a recessive trait. So these white moths can carry that black trait throughout generations. But normally we see way more white moths than black moths. So we're gonna see a lot more white coloration than black coloration just due to the color of the tree bark. But then in the 1950s, the evolution of uh, the industrial revolution happened causing lots and lots of pollution. And so the trees turned this dark soot color for like 15 to 20 years. And very, very quickly after that happened, we see a population boom of black moths and we see many, uh, a much, much fewer or many fewer white moths because you can see that they stick out like a sore thumb. In this polluted situation, the black moth is much better camouflaged. And so the birds all ate the white moths. Um, but then as the Industrial Revolution like kind of uh, cleaned up their act, the pollution lowered, the trees went back to their normal color, and then white moths began selected for again. So our selection actually went towards this direction, and then 30 years later went back this way. Really interesting. If you want to, you can click on this interactive. It's a fun little interactive um, where you obviously can see these black moths. I know I'm a bird. I'm going to eat all of these little black moths here. And I really cannot see the white moths. So as the generations go, the black moths are selected against and the white moths are selected for because honestly, I cannot see them until we go to the year 1950. And then this happens and I can see the white moths really, really easily. So if I'm a little bird, where's my bird? If I'm a little birdie, oh, there you are. The bird is going to eat the white moths a lot easier or a lot faster than the black moths. So you can see how drastically the population would change in just a few short generations. Um, eventually, it got kind of cleaned up and then the population went back to normal. All right, uh, an example of bimodal selection or diversifying selection is these bunnies. Let's say these bunnies live in a rocky mountain area. The gray bunnies are very well camouflaged and these uh, multicolored bunnies are camouflaged, but the white bunnies are not very well camouflaged. If you'd like to, you can play with this simulation. It's another really great fun simulation, um, but I'm not gonna play with it because it does take a little bit of time. But here you can select different types of uh, gene mutations that can occur, and you can select different types of pressures, like maybe tougher food or predation. You can also select whether it's winter or summer, which might make a difference of which bunnies can survive longer. So I highly suggest that you play with this and try to figure out, you know, like how can these adaptations help the bunnies or how could it hurt the bunnies and what traits get passed on to the next generation. So it's a really, really great uh, interactive if you'd like to play with that and see which traits get passed on to next generation. Um, stabilizing selection is going to select for the mean or select for the average. For example, these robin's eggs. If I were a tiny little bird, producing an egg would be a quite a laborious um, and resource intensive task. And so I want to make sure that I get it right. If my neighbor bird, um, the bird next in the nest next door, only laid one egg. That's great for her because she only has one egg to care for and protect. But if anything happens to that one egg, that bird is not going to be passing its genes on to the next generation at all. So it's kind of risky only laying one egg. But if the other bird to the other side of me lays eight eggs, then that means that bird not only has eight eggs to care for and protect, but it also has eight chicks to feed. And that sounds like a really stressful situation, especially if resources are slim. Um, so you do see some birds that will take the weakest baby and throw the weakest baby out of the nest. But eight eggs is still a lot of work and would probably cause the entire hutch to die or the entire hatch clutch clutch 
the entire clutch to die because there's just too many of them. So a better strategy is to only have like three or four eggs. So if anything happens to one or two of them, I'm still passing my genes on to the next generation, but it's not so much work that they're all going to die. So for best survival, the selection is not for birds that only lay one egg and it's not for birds that lay eight eggs, but it's for birds that lay about four eggs. So we're selecting for the mean. There's also something called balancing selection, and this is a form of polymorphism. Uh, poly meaning many, morphism just means forms, where we have different traits within a population constantly popping up. Uh, there's also something called the heterozygote advantage. We talked about it a little bit last week with the ice fish, but this week I'd like to talk about sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a recessive gene that causes mutation on the blood cells. So normally blood cells look very round like this, and this helps them move through the blood vessels very easily. Sickle cell anemia, if you have one of the recessive genes, ha some of your blood is going to have this sickle shape. Normally, it doesn't really affect you, but maybe if you exercise a lot, these little sickle shapes can get stuck in your blood. But here's the thing. In areas where there are lots of mosquitoes, like tropical climates, there's a disease called malaria, and malaria likes to hide inside of the red blood cells. It cannot hide inside of these sickle-shaped shells. So if you have one recessive gene for um, sickle cell anemia, it protects you against malaria. Now, these uh, individuals that are homozygous recessive, they are also resistant to um, malaria, but they don't have any normal blood cells. And so this is a very, very painful and many times fatal disease. So these individuals usually do not survive and reproduce, but the carriers do. So the gene persists and um, it is going to be passed on to the next generation. For instance, let's erase some of those notes. Um, if two carrier parents um, have children, they have a 50% chance of having a malaria resistant child. They have a 25% chance of having a normal child that does not experience the sickle cell um, disease but also is susceptible to malaria. And then we have 25% chance of having an affected child, which will likely not be able to grow and reproduce due to the disease. So we do have an advantage among those heterozygote individuals. Here you can see a, a map of malaria against a map of the allele that carries sickle cell anemia. So you can see, especially in this tropical zone right here, that the instance of sickle cell anemia very closely matches the instance of areas with lots of malaria. So it does give um, that population an advantage in being resistant to this disease. Now, which type of selection do you think would lead to speciesation? Let's go one by one. Stabilizing selection. This is when a normal curve selects for the mean or the median. So stabilizing selection will end up with a smaller curve. We have directional selection. Directional selection means that we are selecting for one extreme or the other, and we will end up with a curve that moves in that direction. Then we have disruptive selection. In disruptive selection, we're selecting against the norm and we're selecting for the extreme. So we end up with a bimodal curve, which can eventually, if these groups move further and further apart and experience reproductive isolation, can become a new species. So C is the correct answer. Um, which of these animals would likely be eaten by a predator? Well, if I'm a predator, I see that guy right away. I see that guy right away. This one's pretty easy to see. I think predators would still eat it, but this guy is pretty well camouflaged. His hair is almost the same color as the background, and this guy will probably be able to survive and pass on that blue coloration to the next generation. All right. Oh, I'm trying to turn that off. 
All right, there are other types of selection pressures. For instance, frequency dependent selection. Don't get intimidated by that word frequency dependent. It just means that the survival of that trait is dependent on how common or how fre frequent the trait is. Um, for instance, if neither trait is dominant over the other one, left versus right, they will be passed on to the next generation at equal rates. But if we have a ton of lefties, like just a ton of lefties, 90% lefties and 10% righty, which one is going to get passed on to the next generation? Well, the one that's more common or the one that's more frequent. So even if it's a recessive trait or even if it's a dominant trait, it, it matters how common the trait is within a population. So a highly, highly dominant trait may not get passed on if it just doesn't happen very often. And a recessive trait may get passed on very, very frequently if it's just super common among the population. Uh, there is also something called sexual selection and artificial selection, which we will go over next. Sexual selection is selection driven by mate choice. Um, so for instance, if the female peacock chooses the male with the largest plumage, that is female mate so uh, choice. It is intersexual, meaning a member of the opposite gender chose the mate based on somewhat arbitrary traits. Now, the peacock is an interesting case because these feathers don't help the male at all in his day-to-day -day life. They're cumbersome, they're large, they attract attention from predators, they prevent him from flying. Overall, just not a good idea, but to the female, it's very attractive because it shows that he's very healthy and he is able to um, find resources. So this is a female mate selection or intersexual selection. Now, there's also something called intrasexual, where a member of its own gender is going to make the mate choice. This is usually driven by male to male competition. It could be female to female competition, such as three toed sloths, where the female operates within a territory and will kick out other females in that territory. In that case, the female is. Um, selecting her territory and the male could enter her territory, but she is competing with other females for that mate selection. More often than not though, we see male to male competition, such as these elk. They are going to fight and the winner of this fight, despite the female's choice, the winner of this fight will earn the right to pass on its genes or it will mate with the female and pass on its genes. So mate choice is driven by competition. It is called intrasexual. If mate choice is, uh, or selection is mate choice of the opposite gender, it is intersexual. Now, what if humans decide who gets to mate? If humans decide who gets to breed and who gets to pass on the genes, this is called artificial selection. And artificial selection is, is super interesting because humans usually choose one or two traits that they really like and they select for that trait. But other traits associated with domestication start to pop up. And it doesn't matter what species this is, it still holds true. Many of these things will happen unintentionally through the process of domestication. For instance, I have a cow and I want to breed it with another cow that produces a lot of milk. I can take those offspring that produce a lot of milk and breed them with other offspring that produce a lot of milk. And eventually I will have a breed of cow that produces lots of milk. But some things that are gonna pop up is like this black and white coloration, this spotted pattern, that's not normal. And I didn't choose to select for that, but because I chose cows that produce a lot of milk, I also received an associated trait. Uh, associated traits, um, for instance, with this fox, a fur pattern is a big one. Uh, floppy ears is another one, a shorter snout, a curly tail, um, fuzzy hair, uh, let's see, a shorter reproductive cycle. For instance, this domesticated fox could probably have pups twice a year, whereas this wild fox would probably only have pups once a year. 
um, usually there is a reduction in brain size and a more reliance on social interactions to get their needs met, meaning they're friendlier, they're more docile. We do this to all kinds of different animals, but we also do this to food. Look at this wild corn compared to the modern corn that we eat. Um, this is not due to genetic uh, modification such as in a lab. This is just due to selective breeding or artificial selection. So when you go to the grocery store and you see a sign that says non-GMO, uh, not really. Most of the fo food that we eat is GMO because most of the food that we eat has been bred for hundreds and hundreds of years to be eaten. Um, it is a far cry from its wild ancestors. Um, if you have time to view this video, I highly suggest it. It is so interesting and it is all about these silver foxes. There was a, an experiment about that lasted for about 50 to 60 years where um, scientists tried to domesticate the silver fox and they got some really interesting results, namely that the foxes started yipping and yapping. Um, whereas the wild foxes more growled and rumbled. Uh, you saw the curly tail pop up at friendly disposition. They started panting um, and of course the coloration changed. So really interesting video if you have the time. Now, um, selective breeding is not the same as genetic engineering. Like I mentioned with the corn, um, while some corn may be genetically engineered, most of the crops that we have are genetically modified through selective breeding, not genetic engineering. But both are goal oriented, uh, whereas natural selection is not goal oriented. There is not a puppet master directing natural selection like there is for genetic engineering or selective breeding. For instance, uh, we learned last semester in the last unit that genetic engineering mainly comes in the form of uh, recombinant DNA in bacteria. So we find a bit of DNA that we like and we splice it into the bacteria, allow the bacteria to reproduce, and then we have lots and lots of that gene available. Maybe the gene produces insulin. That is a form of genetic engineering and it is goal oriented. This cow, however, extreme it may look, is not genetically engineered. It has been selectively bred. Uh, the farmer has selected for the most muscular cow. Um, and this cow is not on a workout regimen or anything like that. This is naturally occurring due to selective breeding. And these cows have become so extreme and so muscular that they actually can't physically mate. So uh, the farmer does something called artificial insemination, which is still not genetic engineering. It is still selective breeding, but they will take the sperm from one cow or one animal, one steer, and put it into the reproductive tract of the female. So um, this is a form of artificial selection or artificial breeding. Now, Evolution is not goal oriented. Think of it as tinkering. Um, it, we can't predict the future or what will happen, but small changes happen due to selection pressures over time. For instance, we have this ancient horse. Uh, the ancient horse has uh, five toes like most other mammals, but as the ancient horse lived its life and its descendants lived its life, maybe there was a mutation for a stunted or a mutated pinky toe. And then that toe became so reduced in future generations that it only had three toes. And then a mutation occurred that caused that toe to become shrunken and reduced. And that just kind of stuck around until they were so shrunken and reduced that they were uh, practically invisible, leading to modern equines which only have one toe, a little bit unusual for mammals. Most um, animals have five digits. So uh, this is not goal oriented. It just happened over time because I can't think of a, a puppet master that would design a one toed animal, but yet it works. Um, another really great example of evolution not being goal oriented is the uh, octopus eye. So evolution is like tinkering. Mammals have developed an eye with a lens and octopi have also developed an eye with a lens. 
But here's the thing. The octopus eye has all of the nerves and the blood vessels located behind the retina, which is the reflective photoreceptor part of the eye. This is great. It's kind of like putting the screen in front of the computer. Uh, the animal is very easily able to see, whereas humans and all mammals, their blood vessels and nerves actually travel in front of the photoreceptor cells in front of the um, retina, the reflective part of the eye, meaning that there is no retina and there are no photoreceptor cells in this area. And to top it off, if you've ever had your eyes dilated, you can actually see these blood vessels. Your brain just kind of filters them out normally. Um, but these blood vessels are moving on top of your photoreceptors. So it's causing some blockage. If I were designing an eyeball, I would definitely design this eyeball as opposed to this one. But that's not what happened. Small tinkering happened over millions of years. And so they both ended up developing an eye with a lens and a cornea, um, but just a little bit differently. Um, more evidence for um, evolution, we can directly observe evolution happening in real time, um, such as antibiotic resistance. In a moment, I'm going to show a video of that antibiotic resistance. I know we don't like videos within a video, so there won't be any sound, but you will very easily be able to see mutations happening within the population as it becomes more and more antibiotic resistant. So the experiment is that there is no antibiotics in these end zones. There's no antibiotics. And then in the next zone, there is like uh, antibiotics. And then in the next zone, there's like 10 times the amount of antibiotics. And in the middle, there is 100 times the amount of antibiotics. So if we start growing bacteria here and here, we would expect them to fill up this entire zone really easily because there's no antibiotics there. But in order to continue to grow, it will have to break into this area that has antibiotics. And you can see that within just a few days, we end up with bacteria that can grow in this incredibly harsh environment at 100 times the normal amount of antibiotics. So I'm going to play that video. It will be silent. If you want to see it with sound, go back to the PowerPoint and watch it through the PowerPoint. <laughs> 
Okay, so besides direct observations, there's other evidence to support the theory of evolution. Even humans support the theory of evolution because you can see within different groups of humans or um, different small populations that we have different adaptations. For instance, the Inuit population has a different liver enzymes that allow them to eat much fattier foods as their population is used to eating whale blubber. So they're very well adapted to that cold environment and even uh, an extreme diet that others would not be able to handle. Um, another group of humans that express a human adaptation is this Bahu tribe, and they are known for their underwater uh, diving capabilities. They are a fishing community, and they spend hours in the water every day fishing by hand with these little slings. Um, they can actually spend up to 13 minutes underwater holding their breath. That is because they have an enlarged spleen that allows them to free dive and um, process their oxygen a lot more efficiently. We also have these uh, Tibetan, um, this Tibetan community, the Himalayan Sherpas. Their community lives very high in the mountains, higher than other communities. And you can tell that one man is of Tibetan descent and the other is a tourist because uh, this man does not have an oxygen mask. He is actually has a higher carrying capacity in his blood. He can carry more oxygen than the tourist. So the tourist needs that oxygen mask, um, which is why Sherpas have made um, money off of tourism by being guides in the mountains because they're actually genetically adapted to the high altitude as opposed to a person who lives on lower lands. Um, humans who are not genetically adapted actually have um, utilized this phenomenon for Olympic training. Athletes will train in mountainous regions like the Swiss Alps, um, and they adjust their bodies to get used to the lower oxygen. And so their bodies produce more red blood cells in that low oxygen environment. And then when they go back to sea level for their competition, they have maintained that higher blood level. It won't last, though. It won't stay there like it will with the Tibetan Sherpas who have that genetic ability. So this is an example of human adaptations. More evidence for evolution is the study called Evo Devo or evolutionary development. It's where we look at different genes across different species and compare them to each other. For instance, the UBX gene creates the body plan or the segmented body plan for this crustacean. It also, it, the same gene has the, um, develops the sectioning of this insect. So the same gene develops the same part of the body. We can study these genes and study their changes over time to study evolution and watch how evolution has changed. We call them Hox genes. Um, there's also embryological studies. Now, these pictures, take them with a grain of salt. They've been published in many a textbook and have been kind of debunked as evolutional evidence. But just visually, you can kind of see that the embryo of many different organisms go through similar developmental stages, such as developing a tail. Humans do not have a tail, yet as embryos, there is a small tail um, that eventually becomes reduced. But this is not evidence that pigs and birds are the same creature, but that they go through similar developmental steps while in embryo. So embryological studies can produce evidence for evolution. We also have something called patamorphs or juveniles, such as the axolotl or the Mexican salamander. Now, the Mexican salamander or the axolotl is a very large sal salamander-like amphibian, but it never grows to the adult stage where it lives on land. It just kind of stays as a juvenile, not quite a tadpole. It has a tail, but it has four legs. Its gills are on the outside, which salamanders, their gills are on the outside as juveniles, but once they become adults, their gills become reduced. And so these patamorphs can tell us a lot about juvenile structures. 
Um, so studying axolotls is, is really cool because they are basically immortal. If you'd like to know more about axolotls, I encourage you to look them up because they're just interesting creatures. Uh, more evidence for evolution. We will talk about the fossil record more next week. We're going to talk about what does the fossil record mean as evidence for evolution. But briefly, we can measure evolution over millions of years by looking at the fossil record. Um, there's also something called biogeography, which means that I can find similar sh um, fossils across different continents. For instance, if I find the fossil of this alligator creature in South America, but I also find it in South Africa, I can make the assumption that these two places must have been connected at some point in time because I'm seeing the same fossil at the same depth. The fossil record is reliable because the older fossils are usually buried deeper in the ground. And so the more surface levels are newer and the deeper levels are older. So if I see this particular fossil on this third level in uh, Africa, but I see it on the seventh level in South America, I might assume that the animal migrated over time to that area. But if I see them both at the same level in the same kind of dirt, then I might assume that they were connected by a land bridge. So that is biogeography, which, which helps make evidence for evolution. Um, we also can study morphological structures. Uh, there is something called a vestigial structure, meaning a structure that's no longer used and so it becomes smaller and more reduced. The best example of that is, of course, those toes on the horse. Um, they were not used, and so they became reduced. But there's no vestigial structure, so this has already happened. When I'm looking for a vestigial structure, I'm looking for something that's still there, but might not be there in, you know, 50, 100 generations. Um, whales and other ocean mammals do not have hind legs, but they still have a pelvic bone. Eventually that pelvic bone um, may disappear, but it's still there now as a vestigial structure. Then we can also look at homologous structures. These are structures across different animals that are um, possibly related by a common ancestor. So for instance, Humans have five phalanges, uh, bats have five phalanges, frogs have five phalanges, and porpoises have five phalanges. We already talked about horses, they're a little bit different. So given that they all have five phalanges, I can imagine that there's possibly a common ancestor that had five phalanges. It would have to be a pretty far common ancestor though because uh, frogs are amphibians while the others are mammals. So we can uh, draw conclusions about homologous structures. This is not to be confused with analogous structures. Analogous structures are similar structures that are not genetically related, such as the bat uh, wing is a mammal wing. Um, it actually uses those five digits um, to stretch a thin piece of skin. Bird wings are made from feathers and insect wings are a chitin type film. None of them are related except through function. They all help that creature to fly, but they're not related. Whereas a homologous structure, we can draw a conclusion about relatedness from it. If you'd like to click on this interactive, you can click on this and view an interactive phylogenetic tree but we will go over phylogenetic trees next week. Um, this is the second half of the video mentioned earlier about the lizards on that island. It's a really great video if you'd like to watch it. It's available in the PowerPoint. All right, don't forget your chapter homework is an optional assignment that helps you um, dive deeper into the content. If you would like to check your answers, you can contact your SI leader and they can help you. There might also be an extra credit opportunity unlocked later where you will need to turn in the chapter homework. So it's always a good idea to use that as a study aid. Your chapter laboratory write-up. If you click on this link, you will get a copy, make a copy of this document, and you will 
fill out this document in lab. If you have me for face-to-face -face lab, bring this document with you. If you do not, you can scan this QR code and watch a video of the lab so that you have all of the answers for the lab quiz. Remember, lab quizzes always do Friday at 5 p.m., but it is completely open note. So it's up to you to watch that video and fill this out so that you have the correct answers. And also don't forget that every Friday at 5 p.m. you have your lecture quiz due. This lecture quiz is housed in Blackboard, but if you would like extra help practicing for the quiz, there is a practice quiz located in your lesson that is not for a grade. Um, I am glad that you joined us this week and I will look forward to seeing you next week.